And I love the time period, like late 60s, mm-hmm. England. Dude, she's like a sociopath or something. She has like no emotion at all. Yeah. Just, just dries a bone. I literally yeah. looked up during like the first two episodes of this season. Like, Is the Queen of England a sociopath? <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Did it autofill as you were typing it in? It did. Is the Queen of England and honestly, the first blank? Andrew stuff came up like, well, his mom's a sociopath, so he might be too. Oh, yeah. interesting. I didn't know that. It's the armchair. Cool. We're live. We're live. We're live. We'll do it live. What's up? Welcome to another episode of the 5050 show, the show where we ask 50% questions about the integration of sales and marketing. 50% 50% questions that are completely irrelevant and 10% questions that dig deep into the history of our guests, mostly unknowingly on their part. I was a film major. You'll have to check the math on that. 5050 show is brought to you by Jump Crew, where we turn online interactions to real world transactions through digital strategy and strategic sales teams. Go to jumpcrew.com and check out some case studies of our work in action. Today's guest is Mr. Rick Hespenhide. Rick, Welcome. Thank you. We're excited to, be to here. Ha- ha- excited to have you. Happy to have you. All the above. So you kind of know a little bit of the format of the show. Um, so half of the questions we want to get into your experience at Jump Crew, learn a little bit more about your experience out of Jump Crew, some of the things you've learned in a sales role, and also being part of a growing company, and maybe some takeaways that you have that we can share with our viewers. And for me, I'm here to learn as well. And then half of the questions are going to be completely off the rails. We're going to talk about stuff that uh, I don't even know where it's going to go. I to like be it. Honest. So I've got a list of some questions. We're going to do a little bit just uh, on the fly. Improv. And then who knows? Maybe we'll uh, dive a little bit deeper into the history of Mr. Rick Hespenhide um, and do a little bit of, a, a little bit of uh, hindsight of your life that you're maybe not okay. expecting. I'm ready. So it's going to be exciting. Let's do it. So right out of the gate, we'd love just to get an introduction to who you are. Um, tell us anything and everything we should know about Rick. Yikes. Um, well, I was born in a small town in Michigan. No. Um, but I just moved here to Nashville probably about a year and a half ago. Um, started here at Jump Crew probably two days after I moved here. Um, but uh, before that, I was in Chicago for a decade um, in a lot of like the startup world. I, worked, I was at Groupon um, around the IPO days, was at a healthcare startup, um, an immigration software startup. Um, really just kind of like fell in love with um, like fast growing companies, um, the craziness of it, all the change. Um, just makes it fun and exciting and like every day is different. And so I think that's one of the reasons why um, I looked at Jump Crew. Um, after talking to Henderson and Solberg and all that, um, I just, they won me over and I'm happy to be here. And that was a quick, quick, super quick intro to me. But yeah, that's where I am now. You told your life yeah. story in 30 seconds. Right? That's all you need to know. About 10% of that was words. about you and then 75% was about Jump Crew. Right? <laughs> so that, that's your life story. Um, so you were born in Michigan. Mm-hmm. You live in Chicago, mm-hmm. but you're a Steelers fan. Who who hurt you? Uh, well, actually, well, I grew up like in Pittsburgh most of my life. So I was born in Michigan. I probably li- I actually lived in Mackinac Island for like until I was in elementary school, which is like this tiny little island. There's no cars. Everybody just rides horses and bikes. Super cool place. You should check it out. Um, but then I moved to Pittsburgh and pretty much stayed there until I graduated high school. And then moved, actually moved down to Florida for a few years. Um, and then came to Chicago, lived t- there for 10 years. And me and my wife and my son moved to Nashville. So I became a Steeler fan. Just pretty much I spent most of my, like, adolescence and early adulthood there. So Yeah, fair enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and so did you seek out a sales career or did you land in it by accident? Can you give us a little backstory about how that came about? Gosh, I felt like it's always kind of been in my, in my blood. Um, I mean, I worked pretty early on like i mean like 14 15 like slinging newspapers and like selling candy and raking leaves and doing all that kind of stuff um i've pretty much done a lot of different kind of sales and i always just kind of fell in love with it at like an early age i think like one of my first i guess like real sales jobs was uh i worked at like a a honda dealership for a while sold cars there um went on to like a like a sports marketing company like selling like big packages to like the super bowl and U.S. Open, um, and that was super fun. I, I love sports, so that was an easy conversation for me, and I, I fell in love with more of like sales in that role. Um, and then when I left there, I, I moved on to Groupon. It just is something that I've always been, I liked and enjoyed, and I've always been in. So I stick with. I feel like what you're good at. Yeah, I, mean, I think sales isn't for everybody, but for people who find it and get hooked on that rush and want to help build something bigger, you kind of just get in that groove and you stick with it forever. Um, 
So you and I actually have something in common, a couple of things in common, but one in particular is that we are both the proud dads of Italian Greyhound. That's dogs. right. Um, what traits of your dog do you have in common, uh, other than the fact that you're both so tiny? <laughs> That's so funny. Almost none is the answer to the question, because I feel like usually owners do like portray traits of their dog. My dog is little. My dog is skinny. My dog is quiet. That is like none of my traits at all. I don't think ever. <laughs> um, but uh, I love the guy. I think I was living in Chicago, uh, P actually Pittsburgh at the time. I had an apartment. I just like Googled great dogs for like apart lim apartment living. Italian Greyhound was just at the top of the list. Now he's 16 years old. Had him since eight weeks and he's He's, he's my firstborn. Yeah. <laughs> he te technically is. Yeah. I, uh, I've actually had the honor of dog sitting. Caesar is his name for a while. And uh, he's a gem. Love that little guy. Uh, he gets along great with my guy, Oliver, who's a handful. Italian greyhounds are what they call Velcro dogs. So they always have to be on you at all times, which conceptually sounds great. Like that's all anybody wants is a dog that loves them. But when you move from point A to point B in your house and the dog just moves and gets on your lap every single time, it starts to... Uh, Starts to get a little old after a little while. Well, mine, he's too old now, and he just chills, sleeps all day. He's he's content. He just stays in his corner, and he loves life. Um, go check him out on Instagram. He has more followers than I do. Uh, Little Caesar Littles <laughs> is yeah. his Instagram page. Uh, I'll be the one doing the shameless plugs on the show. Okay, <laughs> give me a heads up if you're going to do that next time, please. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about your career at Jump Crew. Um, you started. Um, I actually got to be there, and I helped train you, if I remember correctly. Um, so you came on board um, selling what we call Full Funnel, um, so client acquisition for our partners. Um, but you've had a lot of success moving from uh, an individual contributor to team lead role to now manager over uh, with one of our clients. Um, tell us a little bit about that trajectory um, and what you thought some of your keys to success were? Gosh, that's a good question. <clears throat> um, I would have to say is one thing I've probably learned the most at Jump Crew is the importance of your own personal branding, I think, um, and being vocal with what it is that you want to get out of your role in your company um, and communicating that pretty much to everybody that will listen. You know, you have to be an advocate for yourself. And I think one of the things that I've learned is, I can't remember who told me this. It might have been you. Maybe it was Solberg. I don't remember. Um, but it resonated with me. It's that, like, if you want to move into a role and, and, and you know your path uh, and you know you, what you want, it's always better to have everybody else advocate for you for that role. So that way, um, if something does open it up or the position or the, or the opening that you want is available, it's everybody else on your team saying, like, hey, it makes sense for Rick to be in that role. And that speaks so much more than me saying, like, me raising my hand saying, yeah, I want this role. And I think when other people believe in you and have confidence in you and trust you, um, I think that just goes a long way. Um, and so I think that had, to, like, a, a key part with my, my journey here at Jump Crew is just um, earning that trust from everybody around me, um, communicating what it is that I want to accomplish here, um, and then working with everybody and asking for feedback. I think it's important to, like, constantly get 360 feedback from everybody. Like, hey, what's going well? Like, what am I doing well? What do I need to multiply that is doing well? Really, what do I need to focus on? Um, and I think, like, taking that feedback and always asking for it um, and putting it into action um, – is, it worked for me. It's great yeah. perspective. Yeah, on people that want to move into a leadership role, um, you prove that ability through example, and you want there to be a day when the opportunity comes up to move into more responsibility where if you have the opportunity to do that, everyone around you says, yep, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, you do that through just everything that you can control, and you're a perfect example of that. Um, so where were you back in 2011? Can you remember? Maybe around August 2011. August 2011. Uh-oh, I feel like something's coming. Um, I think I was at Groupon at the time. Living in Chica Well, I was living in Chicago, I believe. Um, uh -oh. Well, you must have been dealing with something because I'd like you to explain this post on your Facebook page. <laughs> and uh, we're going to put this up on the screen here. But I'll go ahead and read it for those of you who are listening. Rick Hespenheide, August 4th, 2011. Facebook. <coughs> Millions of people have it. I want it. Where is it? Can someone show me? I have no idea what that means. Um, if I were, were to guess, probably in 2011, it would probably be money because I didn't have any. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's my guess. I have no idea what that, what that means. I could only, only hope. I wonder what like, the comments were on that or what my posts were before that. But yeah, the comments weren't good. Yeah, probably yeah. not. No, I, mean, I, I, I would probably us. comment on that saying like, what are you fishing for here, man? Yeah, it sounds a little bit like a cry for help. It is. Um, it is. Yeah. Do you still wonder where it is? Um, if anyone can show you? Um, well, 
I do have a son and a wife, so yeah, I kind of wonder, like, where is that money? Mm. So I can find it. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you find it, let me know. Okay. <laughs> That's so funny. I can't, I wonder what that was yeah. at the time that I was thinking about. You'd be surprised what I'm capable of finding. Um, Man, you, you went deep there. Uh, That's I did, deep. I, I did go deep. In fact, I spent an inordinate amount of time. I actually canceled multiple meetings to, to do find this. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it shows where my priorities are. Um, so Jump Crew has a unique model. Um, you know, we partner with uh, the companies that we work with as an extension of their business. You know, we're not an outsourced telemarketing company. We're not cold callers. You know, we really function as a partner. Um, and you've had a long relationship with the account that you're on now. Um, and curious if you have any thoughts, perspective on what you think makes a great partnership, um, especially with Jump Crew. Um, you've seen the evolution of this project really from the early days. Um, so you've seen the good, the bad, the ugly, and everywhere in between. And Love to get some of your insight on um, on what you think makes a really impactful, long-standing partnership between two companies. Yeah, that's a really good question, actually, because I think it's something that um, you constantly have to keep top of your mind. Because I feel it's like almost like a diminishing skill is having a good relationship, and if you let, let, let it go to the wayside, um, it has a lot of impact on those around it. So I think that some of the success, like I guess, what you need to do that has a successful partnership is I think communication and transparency um, and really just having a you know a partner that just cares you know I feel like with the account that I, I'm on the partners that we have they, they really just care you know they want to know like what's working what do you need from us um, they give great feedback on um, a micro and a macro level um, like hey like maybe you should tweak this on your pitch like incorporate these hey you did this great like let's see more of that um, and also to just help an organization I feel like the, they're such smart people that we we partner with and I'm lucky in that regard um, and they're just nice people so I think that just having that transparency that communication and also too I think it's important to incorporate both of the cultures you know I think that's really important too because if you're selling a product and if you're a rep and individual contributor you do have to have a piece of jump crew and join in on that culture and contribute to it and on the flip side too of that partner you know they they embody you know, a voice and a message and a culture. And I think that it's like marrying those two, which can be tricky, but I, I feel like that's, um, that leads to a successful team is to make, make them feel like they are, cause they are, they are a part of, or, of both organizations. It's a partnership. And I think like balancing and, um, that culture incorporating, um, a shared value to, um, and a mission, um, works well. You know, I think that, um, one of, uh, our, the partner that I'm on, they live by, um, um, like an ethos, I guess, if you will, will chirp. Um, gosh, if I don't get this right, he's going to kill me. But it's it pretty much means uh, customer, uh, customer first, uh, helpful, empathetic, um, resourcefulness, and proactive. Yes, I nailed it. Nice. I'm You're glad. Done. They're going to love that. Right, um, right but I, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think incorporating that, and that's part of their ethos. So I feel like if we everybody on both sides live, lives by the same values and, and, and um, kind of like North Star Compass, it um, leads to good things. That's a really interesting point, actually, because I think in sales, we oftentimes see it as trying to convince somebody to buy what we're selling. And maybe if you're selling a product like a piece of software or a physical good, like maybe that can work to a certain point. But that's not that's not what we do. Um, our partnerships are just that they are partnerships like we are diving into this opportunity together as mutually invested as the other. And there's going to be days where we have a lot of problems. There's going to be days where everything seems like it's humming along. And I think finding that culture fit with that partner is a really interesting point that you made because you have to have the same set of values, same ideals, and the same realistic expectations going into it so that you can work collaboratively and you don't feel like one is judging the other um, and you're constantly under a microscope. So I think we've done a better job of that as of late of really checking those boxes before we engage in a partnership to make sure hey, we're going to be representing your brand on the front lines. Um, so we want to make sure that we're as aligned with your values as possible and, and vice versa. So I think that makes for a really good partnership. Um, what is the uh, first day of the week? Is it Sunday or is it Monday? It's Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week. Mm. Interesting. Why? I don't know. Just because it is? Because it, they put it up on the calendar. Yeah, I, the well, first I guess day so. Yeah. Football starts on a Sunday, so that's a good start to the week. I Football think. starts on a Thursday. Oh, actually, because mm -hmm. you're right. But Sunday's the first first day of the week, so actually, you know. You start the week off with football. So, yeah, okay, so there's two different ways to look at that, yeah. So football, the week of football starts on a Thursday because they say the first game of week 13 is on th Thursday. So that's probably mutually exclusive from the calendar days of the week. And then days of the week, 
Sunday is tricky because I think psychologically most people see Sunday as like, well, I'm kind of wrapping this whole thing up. But what they're really wrapping up is the weekend. Like they're taking Saturday and Sunday and saying, okay, this is coming to an end. and I have to go back to work tomorrow. So what are you so thinking? Is it Monday? You know, I have no opinion. Uh, I have no opinion. I'm up to be persuaded. That's, that's really why this question was here is I'm looking for someone to help me under, understand that's this fair. fundamental human question that everyone <laughs> has struggled with since the beginning of mankind. Tale as old as time. The tale of tale as old as time. Um, so just mechanically, like on a day-to-day basis, um, you're supporting a team of 20 people now. Um, so that's grown from four, um, which is where that started about a year and a half ago. So we've had a lot of growth there. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you as a manager see in supporting a team of 20 people? The biggest challenges, um, I think time. That's like the, the main thing um, in trying to balance that out. Um, and, and something that I've had to, to learn along the way is being able to say no, which is something I just hate saying, but I feel like if you want to make sure that um, you're contributing in, in a positive multiplier, you need to make sure that the, the time that you spent is is helping support your team come to like a, a common goal or objective. And um, if it doesn't fall within those boundaries, then you just need to say no, you know, and, and delegate. And I think that's part of uh, something else that I had to learn was being able to, because I'm more of an introvert at heart. So it's hard for me to like just branch out and talk to people that I know. And one of the things that has challenged me is being able to meet more people within the company um, because I, I need them. You know, I need their support. I need um, their skill set that I don't have and I need to learn from it. Um, and some of those things that I do have to say no no to, it's it's because like I need to learn and I have to figure out the right way to do things um, and, and help delegate and help us all come to the right to the right um, success and objective. Um, and I think that's really the main challenge is just time and trying to balance it all. Do you have a process for deciding what you say no to and what you don't? Is there like a checkbox how you determine how to allocate your time or is it more based on feel? And if so, how do you define that? Mm, that's a good question. Um, and, and I'd like to think that I do. Um, I think that I try to come up with really what my own my own values or at least my own, my own um, job description is and I feel like that's helping my team be collaborative and um, reaching a common objective and I feel like if my time spent or this hour spent isn't helping my team and myself like meet that common ob- objective um, then it's just something that I, you know it's going to fall, fall to the wayside that I need to delegate into someone who's better equipped to 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 handle that task. Um, but, I, you know, I always have to make sure, like, it's help, helping move the needle. Obviously, we're in a sales organization, so um, it's a lot of it's revenue-driven. So I have to, I have to define um, what, what am I doing ultimately? Is it um, supporting um, growing revenue? You know, and if that question is no, then maybe it's something that I should also say no to, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So I think those two things are, are, are kind of like my, my North Star. And if it doesn't fall in, into one of those two buckets, it's usually something that I have to um, respectfully decline to mm-hmm. do. Yeah. Um, who's your favorite pop artist? Mm, my favorite pop artist. Um, gosh, um, that's a good question. Um, I would have to say, I guess it all depends on the time period, but I would have to maybe the, like the Chili Peppers. I don't know. Maybe. Mm. You had a tweet um, from <laughs> April 23rd of this year that would beg to differ. Um, uh, I quote from Hespenheide Rick. A, uh, a screenshot of Beyonce performing um, while she's singing Give It Up For My Dancers. You said, nothing like a little bee to get that morning started. Hashtag, I woke up like this. She's a queen, man. She's a legend. Is um, this part of Rick's daily routine in the morning just to get psyched up for the day? Just a little bit of, a little, a little bit of Beyonce to start off the day. Um, not a morning ritual, but I think it's right, like right when that Netflix documentary came out. And she's a baller. Was that de- documentary great? It was amazing. I try. I keep trying to convince my wife to watch it, and weirdly, why am I the one trying to convince her to watch it? Yeah. Uh, and she won't bite on it. I'll get her there though. She works so hard, um, and it was actually inspiring for me because I'm like, she she works nonstop, and she went through this big tour um, right after you know giving birth to her child and getting back into shape and so much hard work. And I think she gave some performance that was ridiculous, like 45 minutes long or something, um, nonstop. Um, and she, she's a queen, man. She's where it's at. She's awesome. So that's pretty much how you determine uh, whether or not you help someone on your team is at what point in her discography you are at that current moment. What would Beyonce do? What would Beyonce do? We'll get those bracelets printed. (laughs) 
Um, so what's next for you? You know, have you thought a little bit about your career trajectory, either jump crew or, or otherwise? Mm -hmm. We're not here to judge. You know, yep. no one's going to see this video anyway. So, you know, this you can say whatever you want here. You're in a safe space. Um, so what do you think is next for Rick? Um, besides being a, a famous uh, YouTube YouTuber on, on smoking and barbecuing, I would have to say that I think what's next for me is um, furthering my career. I think it's more... Like as I get more experience being a manager and um, creating successful teams and culture, I think one at some point in my career I want to be able to to, to empower managers to do that on, on their team. So like move maybe into like a director of sales role. I love uh, the just the strategic planning of accounts and um, thinking more like down the road. You know, six months from now, two years from now, and more of the planning behind it. So it's something that I really enjoyed. And I think that um, just at my time in Jump Crew, I kind of even found more of my passion, um, which was more of like empowering people and finding out what their career paths are and helping them come up with uh, a plan in order to, to try to accomplish that. Um, which I feel like one of my, I feel like one of the mistakes I made in my career was just waiting too long. Like I just loved being, I love sales and I love being an individual contributor. Um, I never realized that I loved the, the you know, empowering other people part of it until just recently. Um, and now I would, I wish I would have done that like eight years ago, nine years ago. Um, but I think that just doing that on a larger scale is something that would just make me happy. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great to know. And, you know, as people elevate in an organization, they get a lot more insight into the challenges that come with each new step. I think that there can be this idea, oh, well, if I'm an individual contributor role, then the next step logically for me is to move up more leadership, right? And you move up and you move up. And that comes with its own unique set of challenges that most people may not even know that are there. And it's great to hear, like, as you move through the organization, you've actually relished those opportunities and they mesh really well with what you're trying to accomplish. And I think I'll speak for everybody and say you're pretty damn good at it. So, yeah. that. Um, so when you, I, this is a little bit of a uh, um, kind of an off topic question as we do with Fit 50 show, but if you were having a photo taken of you, what would you say your best angle is? Um, my best angle. Mm -hmm. I probably have to say like my left side. So actually I'm just going on this side because like a lot of people don't notice, especially with I have the glasses on I actually broke my nose a long time ago. So my nose kind of like goes like this a little bit. So, if like you might be able to see it now if you look that way it's like almost like kind of pointing at the camera but now that i'm this way like you don't tell so i think like this side really side. so if you were going to take a selfie of yourself you would do it this direction probably yeah probably i think so well uh -oh. history would actually beg to differ um so let's take a look here at some photos that i found oh my gosh look at that that is like <laughs> so this is actually you going this was this pre nose break that's because this is important uh, to you to, to i don't just, I think so, no. And mm. if you can see, kind of, the nose is kind of like pointing up. What about this one? Oh my God. Looks like we've got about the same angle, a little bit more straight on here, but no mustache and, and side sideburns. Oh so. my gosh, man, yeah. you're digging so deep. That's so long ago. That's, yeah. I think that's actually when I worked. Gosh, that must've been over 10 years ago. Uh, this is actually from three weeks ago. Oh. Um, here's another one. I had more hair, so I wish this, I was <laughs> so Here's another good one. You're starting to see a theme here. Um, oh, here's another one, just Rick. Just working away. What are you thinking about here? Um, I don't know. Probably w what millions of people have um, yeah. that I don't. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I think it looks like you're sending in an audition tape for Office Space. <laughs> How about now? Oh, oh this is oh Rick. Gosh. Just your head's a little chilly here. I am. You know, it's cold inside. You know, maybe the heat was out. I'm not sure. You actually did go a little bit more chin strap hair on the facial hair here than before. I'm not sure if this is before or after. We may be going back in time, but if you want to bring back the chin strap, I'm not going to. I'm no, that needs object. to stay retired. How about this? Oh, yeah, at least I'm repping the Steelers. You are repping the Steelers. I was living Steelers. in Florida at the time. I know yeah. exactly when that was. So you do have an angle. I would suggest For the record, one. I don't think I've taken a selfie in the past decade. Uh, well, that's a huge missed opportunity because you're only <laughs> more handsome now than you were then. And this angle is actually pretty good for you. Um, cool. So last question I'm going to ask is um, more so just about um, how you think that Jump Crew um, has evolved over the past couple of years. So you've been here for a year and a half, maybe a little bit more than that. Yeah, I started yeah. in June of like two Junes ago. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we're a startup um, mm -hmm. and uh, we're constantly evolving. And you've seen a lot of those changes. Um, think about how things have changed from when you started till now. Mm -hmm. What do you think are some of the biggest shifts that you've seen? The biggest shifts, um, man, that's a good question. I think that one of the biggest changes is almost like a shift in, in, in mindset and, and mindset and priorities. I feel like as you grow and as you scale, um, you also need to, to switch your priorities around too, so you, that way you don't lose like some of the culture. So I think I feel like that um, now it's becoming more of a priority in order to like not to lose that because as we grow and we have you know now like I guess hundreds of people I don't even know what we're at now four or five hundred I'm not even sure but I think when I started I was like 
just under 100, I think. Um, and so I think that's um, one shift in, in, in within the company is just prioritizing that because that can get lost along the way. And I've seen that happen to other companies that had explosive growth, growth, and it's hard to manage and it's a diminishing skill. And if you don't like nurture it, it's going to die. So I feel like um, the shift in priority there is something that I've noticed a change in. Um, I feel like just a, sh a shift in our hiring too. It, you know, we, we are gaining ground and um, becoming recognized, you know, in Nashville. Um, and I feel like a lot of people are applying here and growing here and we have to, you know, we, we want also want to be productive in our own culture and make sure that people are fit too. And we're being, I think more, more selective to make sure that, um, we are hiring the right people in the right skill set and hiring, you know, what we're, we're missing within the company. Um, and, and so I think that's also something that's changed over time. Um, and also to our locations, gosh, it's like this is the second location now that I'm based in and we're changing again in a few months. So yep. that's definitely a big one I'm excited for. Yeah, I think there can be this misconception that um, culture is something that you define after the fact and then you convince your current employees that this is what they need to believe in. But I think we've tried to shift the opposite direction where culture is built by hiring the right types of people that believe in the set of values that the company stands for. Um, and so we can build that from the front end. And I think it makes it more manageable for us to maintain that throughout their experience at Jump Crew than it would be for us to retroactively go back and say, all right, this is what our company culture is. And then defining the difference between what I see is like perks, right? Like, oh, yeah, PTO or like bring your dogs to work. Like those are perks. And I don't think that those should be miscategorized as culture. I think culture is that investment in a belief system and then the cumulative investment from the people who work at the company and then perks are something that you can earn. Um, but that's just my, that's just my perspective. But I think a lot of people here at Jump Crew may feel similarly. Um, what's your eating strategy at a buffet? Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> that's my strategy. Um, uh, I don't know. I think that, I mean, obviously I don't have much of a healthy diet. I think <laughs> so. I think like eat pretty much like whatever it is that I like, I'll go for yeah. I think is no secret. Um, that goes for drinks too, I think. Um, but I don't know. I don't really have a strategy. I think whatever. Usually start at the opposite end. I'll leave the salad for last. You go desserts work. down? Oh, well, not desserts. But maybe like more of the main course. Mm -hmm. And then like work backwards. I'm not much. I'm more of like a savory guy, not a sweet guy. Sure. So I usually skip dessert and save that for more of like, you know, the main course. Yeah, for me, like it's important. Obviously, I'll skip a salad once in a while. That's why <laughs> I'll start at the opposite side. It's important to keep up appearances on my plate at a buffet. I just need like a couple of pieces of lettuce or one green bean. Like I just need that color contrast so that people don't judge me. Maybe I'm judging myself. But... I go and do like little portions of everything that looks interesting to me first. And then I'll go back and double down the second time around. And then for like the eighth or ninth times up, that's typically when I start adding dessert. But do you usually like when you have a plate full of like different things, do you like have one bite of each thing and like in a rotation or do you finish one thing and go into the next and then on to the next? Yeah, I'm, I'm in rotation. Me too. Yeah, I'll I'm rotate rotation through. Too. Yeah, because I, I, I don't know. I feel like I want to make sure, see how they complement each other because yeah. then you can change the order, right? Like if I take a bite of one thing, the next and then the, the second and then the third, then I'm like, ooh, what if I go second, first and then third? And what if I go third and then first and then second? Yeah. You know, God, I should probably get a hobby. So thanks for tuning in to this edition of the 5050 Show with Rick Hespenheim. We appreciate you joining us. Um, you can check out jumpcrew.com check out some case studies of our work with some partners. Uh, in sales and marketing. And uh, we look forward to having you tune in to next week's episode.